Is there ever a time when killing is justifiable? If so, when Moses killed the Egyptian in Exodus chapter 2, was this justified? Today's video marks our fourth episode in our Life of Moses study, and we're going to continue where we left off in Exodus chapter 2. Um, in that last episode, we read the first 10 verses of Exodus 2, where it describes the story of how Moses was hidden on the Nile in a waterproof basket. He then is found by the Egyptian princess who hires Moses' mother, Jochebed, to be his nurse. Verse 11 begins with this child that's found in the river to have grown up and about 40 years pass between verse 10 and verse 11 as we can see here in Acts chapter 7. The author of Hebrews also elaborates on this time saying, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. We discussed these passages at length in the last episode so I won't dwell on them much here. However, they are very important for us establishing the context of where we begin today. Also, if you're new to the series, there is a playlist in the description if you would like to watch the previous episodes. So again, about 40 years pass from verse 10 to verse 11 in Exodus chapter 2. And during this time, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he refused to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin that the Egyptians partook in. Exodus chapter 2 verse 11 begins, Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his fellow Hebrews and he saw their hard labors and he saw that an Egyptian was beating one of his fellow Hebrews. So he looked this way and that and when he saw that no one was around, he struck and killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. From these verses, we see a story where Moses is going out to his fellow Hebrews, and he sees one slave in particular that's enduring physical abuse. Moses looks around to see if anyone's looking, and then he goes and kills the Egyptian and hides the Egyptian's body in the sand. So I had a few questions when I got to this passage. So why did Moses do this, and was his killing of the Egyptian justified? And before you answer this question in your brain, I would like to issue a word of caution. Devoted, sincere, and brilliant theologians have disagreed on this point, and so I would humbly encourage you to also be humble as I lay out some of the arguments um, that people have on this. The reason the answer to this question is so important is because it has to do with how we look at the ethics of civil disobedience, warfare, and self-defense. Many feel very strongly about these topics, especially here within America. I will do my best here to discuss these different points of view as objectively as I can. However, I am not without biases myself. We all have biases, and I feel I must share mine um, um, before we move forward here. For full transparency, I would not place myself in the pacifist camp. I have generally positive ideas about just war and self-defense, and I tend to err on more of uh, that side of the spectrum. I'm not stating these to say that that's what you should believe or that's even the correct view. I'm just stating this for full disclosure before we get into this. I also did my best to keep an open mind on this, and I was challenged throughout this study, and my hope is that you are as well. Even if I don't change your mind on anything, my hope is that you have a greater understanding of your own view, but also a respect for those who think differently on this subject. The first position that we are going to be discussing is the unjustified killing position, which would state that Moses was unjustified in what he did. They would equate what Moses did to murder. Evidence used to support this claim would include Moses looking around to see if anybody was looking, and the quick burial of the Egyptian followed by his fleeing to Egypt in later verses. To someone in this view, they would submit that this is the behavior of a guilty man and his soul was being convicted of his sin. This view would also often include that Moses didn't have the authority to do what he did. And additionally, many cite the fact that Moses had to spend 40 years in Midian as an indication that Moses had much to learn in the school of God, um, further demonstrating the purported evil of his actions. To summarize the main points of the unjustified killing position, it primarily relies on one, symptoms of a guilty conscience, two, Moses having a lack of authority, and three, Moses having to learn in the wilderness may be evidence that he had much to learn before he led Israel out of Egypt, therefore showing that his uh, killing of the Egyptian was wrong. One of the more famous proponents of the justified killing position is the French reformer John Calvin. As you can see here, Calvin believes that Moses was, quote, inspired by the Holy Spirit with special courage for the performance of this act, and that this act was not rash. 
He was burdened with holy purpose to set the captive Hebrews free, and this act was a fulfillment of this vocation. You can read that whole quote here if you would like, um, which comes from his commentary on this particular passage. One of the main passages that uses evidence to show that Moses' killing of the Egyptian was justified includes Acts chapter 7, which reads, But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his countrymen, the sons of Israel. And when he saw that one of them was being treated unjustly, he defended and took vengeance for the oppressed man by fatally striking the Egyptian. And he thought that his brothers understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. And on the following day he appeared to them as they were fighting each other, and he tried to reconcile them to peace by saying, Men, you are brothers, why are you injuring each other? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he fathered two sons. Supporters of the justified killing position will cite that Luke's retelling of Stephen's speech does not condemn Moses for what he did. However, just because something is omitted doesn't necessarily mean that the contrary is implied here in the text. That is a problem that actually both sides of this debate often run into. However, we don't see the same reasons for fear as described by those who believe the unjustified killing position in Acts. For context, the entirety of Acts chapter 7 shows Moses alongside the prophets of the Old Testament being rejected by their own people. Then Stephen draws a comparison between this rejection of the prophets with the rejection of Jesus by the Pharisees. Acts 7 reads, This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel, who appeared to him in the thorn bush. Then in verse 51, where Stephen concludes his speech, it says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, and you have now become betrayers and murderers of him. We see a couple interesting things from these passages, including why Moses ultimately left Egypt. This is important because if he did kill this Egyptian with some sort of revolution in mind, why didn't he stand up for his actions? After all, he would have had to view this killing of the Egyptian as providing justice to the people in some way. Let's read the passage in Exodus and then read the passage passage in Acts to find the answer to this. So in Exodus chapter 2 it says, So he looked this way and that, and when he saw that there was no one around, he struck and killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. Now he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you ruler and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely this matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard about this matter, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Acts 7 says, And on the following day he appeared to them as they were fighting each other, and he tried to reconcile them to peace by saying, Men, you are brothers, why are you injuring each other? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he fathered two sons. So when did Moses begin to feel fearful? Verse 14 gives us the answer, and it says that the fear came after he was breaking up the fight between the two Hebrews, the day after he killed the Egyptian. Moses says, surely this matter has become known. Now, was Moses afraid because what was done in secret is now exposed? I think this is part of the explanation. However, I think it's also very plausible to say that a large portion of Moses' fear was also because the Hebrew people rejected Moses as their leader because of what we see in Acts chapter 7. Moses also would have been obviously afraid because Pharaoh was trying to kill him. So the question really becomes, why did Moses do this in the first place? And to do this, we're going to have to rewind a little bit. At some point in Moses' upbringing, he was clearly taught the things of God, whether it was by his parents or someone else. As Hebrews says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. Moses understood that he was a descendant of Abraham and that the males were to be circumcised on the eighth day to be set apart 
and that the people of Israel were prophesied to be taken out of Egypt and back to the promised land. And this is what we see in the rest of Exodus. An example of this would be in Exodus chapter 4, where God's actually going to kill Moses because he didn't circumcise his child. I bring this up because clearly he knew what he was supposed to be doing, and even with that knowledge, he was disobedient to the point where God was ready to finish his life. So let's go back to the day before Moses kills the Egyptian. I want you to imagine being in the position that Moses was in. He's a leader in the Egyptian court. He's probably the most powerful Hebrew in the land, and he regularly sees the injustice that his people go through. But what do we see? He doesn't get callous to it. He remains sensitive to the pains of his people. Then one day he sees an Egyptian beating one of his countrymen, and he kills the Egyptian. Do, does he try and reason with this slave master? We don't know. Was the slave being beaten to death? We don't know. However, what if this slave was being beaten to death? The passage itself doesn't say. However, you know, there's no hospitals, obviously, back then for the Hebrews to go to. If they get lacerations to, to be stitched or broken bones to be set in place like we do, if you were severely injured back then, you were far more likely um, to die. So this brings us to the important question of if this was a life or death scenario, does that change the morality of the situation? In America, to the best of my knowledge, it is legal to respond to deadly force with deadly force. Actually, I, I don't know if this is true for all of America. I know at least here in Texas, if someone approaches you or a loved one with deadly force, you are allowed to meet them with deadly force. Now, obviously, America or Texas is not the standard for which we derive our ethics or theology. But let me ask you this. Is it possible that Moses was attempting to save the life of the Hebrew? I think it would be reasonable to say, at a minimum, that is well within the realm of possibility. The next day, Moses goes to break up a fight, and he seems to have an expectation of respect among these two Hebrews. But what do they do? They mock him. Nope, the baby just woke up. Hang on just a second. Good morning. All right, let's see how she does. Let's go back again. So the next day, Moses goes to break up a fight and seems to have this expectation of respect among the two Hebrews. But what do they do? They mock him. So he left the Hebrews because they rejected his authority, at least partly because of this. Acts 7 confirms this. Additionally, he didn't obviously want to get killed by Pharaoh um, because that's what he was going to do. I think these arguments provide a plausible answer to the first point of the unjustified killing camp, which was Moses was acting out of guilt. However, I don't think we can fully eliminate either possibility. The third point of the unjustified killing camp is where Moses is sent off to the wilderness because of his purported rash behavior. This argument, I think, is the weakest of the three just because Moses is forced to learn in the wilderness doesn't imply that what Moses did right before this was right or wrong. It's akin to saying that because Moses is never condemned in scripture for his killing of the Egyptian, therefore it's okay. You don't get to read into the passage what isn't there. In the case of Moses' time in the wilderness, it just means that he had some things to learn. And there are examples of this in the following <laughs> chapters of Exodus. Oh, are you tired still? Yeah. Don't be sad. Here, you can play with my old one, okay? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. You want <laughs> You want mine, I see. Oh, I imagine that sounds wonderful. Here you do it. Ready? Are you hungry? Okay. I'll be back. To summarize so far, I would say that it is possible, and I would go as far to say as that is likely, that Moses was not acting in guilt in response to the first argument. The third argument wasn't very strong to begin with, since again, just because Moses was sent into the wilderness, it doesn't mean that uh, he was sent to the wilderness because he killed the Egyptian. Moses was human and likely had plenty of problems to work on, and we see this um, to be true in the rest of Exodus. This doesn't mean that his killing of the Egyptian was justified. We still have have one more point to address, and this is the second point, which has to do with Moses' authority. This is a much more difficult point to work through since it relies on having an understanding of the ethics of civil disobedience, self-defense, and warfare. This is also going to require us to look elsewhere in scripture for clarity on this issue. It doesn't seem likely that what Moses did was legal in Egyptian law. However, we also don't know if what he was doing was a defense of a life being taken. There are a lot of 
details that would be very important in determining the morality of this situation, but they aren't mentioned in this story. Perhaps this is because I just missed something during the research process. Outside of that reason, based on what I've read and, and studied on this passage, I don't think that determining if Moses' killing was justified or unjustified can be known 100% or known beyond the shadow of reasonable doubt. I think I would probably be more open to the justified killing position, but I definitely don't feel comfortable going as far as Calvin did and saying that it was the Holy Spirit that led him to do it. But again, we don't know for sure. And because of the lack of clarity, I don't think it is wise to base our ethical judgments off of this passage. What I found interesting is that many books try to use this passage to justify their position of ethics, including one of my favorite books on ethics that I've referenced on this channel before. Consequently, this is one of the few areas where I have any sort of disagreement with it. For the next few videos, we're going to be taking a break from the Life of Moses study and we're going to be diving into what scripture has to say about civil disobedience, self-defense, and the rules of warfare for Christians today. This has a lot of significance for what we're reading about in Exodus right now, as well as what we'll be covering in the future. For now, I don't think we can answer, again, 100% if the killing of the Egyptian was justified or not. Um, but we'll be learning a lot more about the ethics of these kinds of things in the next few videos. Thanks for watching this video and making it this far, um, and we will see you next time when we discuss civil disobedience from a biblical perspective.